go into Ephesians, I think it's important that we remember how much God thinks of church. Um, is church important? Um, in the book of Ephesians, the Lord calls the church his body. He calls it his bride. He calls it his dwelling place or temple. In other places, he calls it his precious possession. And I don't know about you, but as a man, um, there's a couple things that you just don't mess with. You don't mess with my wife, my bride. Keep your hands off my body. <laughs> don't come to my house. You know, come mess with my house. And, you know, there are a few precious possessions that um, you just better not touch. So when God uses these analogies for us, he says the church is his bride. He says it's his body. He says it's his dwelling place. You can pretty well rest assured that it's really important to God. It's very important to God. That's why he uses those analogies. I don't think I think it's very important that we realize that Galatians came before Ephesians. Galatians is who you are in Christ. Who you are in Christ because it's so much more important that you know who you are in Christ before you try to fit into a church. Because a lot of times we get the cart before the horse. We decide we're going to do all these things because we want to be a Christian. Um, a fella told me, so I'm interested in coming out to Otter Creek. I want to visit there because I'm still trying to be a Christian. And I thought, wow. you know. And I know the guy has heard of the grace of God, and I know he's heard about being um, right with God because of what Jesus did and not because of what he's done. But there is that idea of trying to be a Christian rather than act how you are because you already are one. So Galatians came before Ephesians in that respect. Also, if you remember in Galatians, he spent a lot of time explaining to us who we were, who we are in Christ, before he takes one step into what we should do. The same thing is going to happen in Ephesians. In Ephesians, before he tells us how to act as a church or belong as a church or interact as a church, he tells us who we are in Christ. It's so much more important to have relationship before you have performance. We're a very performance-based society, aren't we? It's kind of like, what have you done for me lately? I mean, you don't show up to work, you don't get paid. You might have a wonderful relationship with people, you screw up for a week, it's all over. You've, you've blown all that goodwill. Um, it's a very do, do, do society. And not, you have the status and it's complete and it's good. So Ephesians is very important that way. So before you, before you walk in Christianity, you need to know who you are as a Christian in Galatians. In Ephesians, before you know how to act among the people of God, you need to know who you are in Christ. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln said, or it was credited to, to Abraham Lincoln for saying that if he gave him six hours to chop down a tree, he would spend four hours sharpening the axe. And for any of you who are, you know, who work with tools, you realize you get the wrong tool or a dull blade, it makes for a hard, hard go of it. So you need to sit down and make sure everything's like it's supposed to before you engage in the activity. I, I know that as a, as a carpenter, if you put on a new saw blade with carbide tips, you're like, wow, what was I using before? This is like butter. You know, or it, you get the right tool for the job as a mechanic, like, well, it's nothing now. This is easy. And so God wants us to be tuned up, sharpened up, and in the right frame of mind, knowing who we are before he says, be in a church. Be in a church. I do have a prayer, though, this morning. And the prayer is that God would supernaturally, supernaturally open your eyes to see you how he sees you. That he would supernaturally open your ears that you would hear what he has for you. Because it doesn't matter how well you put this, how your illustrations or how you put it in words, it's a supernatural act to see how God views us as human beings. In fact, if, if we did this study backwards, the last few uh, verses of this chapter is Paul praying for these people that they were supernaturally be endowed with wisdom and knowledge 
of who they are in Christ. So the Apostle Paul writes this to the church of the Ephesians. He spent three years in this town, three years teaching in this town, and now he's in prison. He's in prison, and he's not saying, I pray that you get me a good lawyer to get me out of prison. I pray that, you, that this thing gets turned over on appeal. I pray that there's an earthquake and God gets me out. No, he's saying, at the end of this book, he's saying, I pray that I would be effective where I'm at in witnessing for God. And his big thing is he wants to get this, this concept across to them of who they are in Christ and who they're supposed to be as a body of Christ. So it just starts out, let's just start out in verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of Christ, or by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are into the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he says, I'm an apostle by God. In other words, this isn't something that men appointed him to. This is something that God told him to do. He's also addressing this to Christians, to the faithful people in the church of God. This is not for unbelievers. Be very careful about putting your morals and your obligations and, and what you should be on the outside world. Whenever the outside world acts like they do, don't be surprised. That's who they are. And so whenever we try to legislate onto them what is you know, morality or what, how they should act or what they should do, it always backfires. So just remember, this is to the church. Now it says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual gift. Now he starts out in verse 3 saying here that he has blessed us with every spiritual gift. And you know what that means? That you're equipped for anything that God asks you to do. Um, Later on it's going to say something about adopted as sons or adopted. And adoption doesn't mean that he took someone who wasn't his and made him his. It means that he's taking somebody who is his and elevating him to the full position of sonship. The full position of sonship. If you're in the Lord, if you have accepted Christ, there's nothing standing between you and doing what he tells you to do. He's equipped you fully to do what you're supposed to do. He's blessed you with every spiritual gift. Now, sometimes people get involved with What is my spiritual gift? Specifically, I want to know exactly what I'm gifted in. And I would say that if you pursue trying to bring Jesus to the world, you'll be gifted in different ways at different times. When you need the gift of being able to speak, you'll be able to speak. When you need the gift of knowledge, he'll give you knowledge. When you need the gift, think of the Apostle Paul. What gifts did he have? Whatever ones that he needed at the time. We don't like take our gift and polish it up and put it on the shelf and go, I have the gift of whatever it is. Here, let me show you what it is. No, you exercise your gift as you're doing what God asks you to do. So in this first one, it says that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And it says, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. So he chose you. He's gifted you in every spiritual way and he chose you. Have any of you, uh, I'm sure all of you, ever have this experience of being on the playground and, and they pick sides? And they choose you. Did you get chosen first? Or second? Or third? Or were you one of those throw-ins at the end? Like, they pick sides and they go, okay, you three go over there and you two go over there at the end. That's kind of a, uh, kind of a crappy feeling, isn't it? you're not really chosen, you're just pushed over to the side. Like, well, you take the, you know. Know this in the Lord, that he chose you. He picked you. He had a choice and he chose you. That means something to me, especially in a world that doesn't always pick us or picks us last. God cho- chooses us. It also says he chose us before the foundations of the world. He chose me before I was born. I think that might be because if he'd waited till after he was bor- I was born, he might not have chose me. <laughs> I think it was Dwight L. Moody that said that. He said, yeah, he chose me before I was born because if he'd waited till after, he might not have chose me. 
Well, that's not true. God knew. God chose us according to his foreknowledge. He knew the beginning from the end, and he picked us before the foundations of the earth. It says that we should be holy, holy and blameless. You know what holy means? It's one of those Christian words that's like, oh, are you holy? It's like, what is, what's that mean? Holy just means set apart for a purpose. It means a specific purpose for a specific thing. You know how I get in trouble at home? I take one of my wife's bowls that's set apart for cooking, and I go put, like, gasoline or motor oil in it. And I just use it for what I need it for. What's wrong with that, right? I'll wash it when I'm done. No, that's holy. It's set apart. It's for something. It's for a specific purpose. Um, I'm sure some of you can identify with you go buy groceries, like something you're going to bake, something like chocolate chips or something, and then somebody gets into them. You're like, hey, I bought that for a specific purpose. I had a, a reason for buying that. You're wrecking things. That's what it means to be holy, to be set apart for a purpose. The next thing, it says holy and blameless. What does blameless mean to you? Blameless means God sees you as perfect. Now, if I were just to get up here and teach this message on my own, how that we have every spiritual gift, how that we're chosen in the Lord, how that we're holy and we're blameless, somebody might accuse me of being like Joel Olstein. I'm only telling you good things. I'm only telling you what you want to hear. I don't have the license to tell you what you want to hear. But it's so good that God put this down there's going to be a lot of different things that, that we go through here, and I'm going to go through this list fairly quickly. But the cool thing is, is this isn't some outline I wrote down. This is the Word of God, and you can go back through this every day this week. And look, really? Am I blameless? Am I holy? Am I? It's not Rich said. The Bible says this. The Bible says that we're holy and we're blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons. And like I said, that adoption as sons, and we were, nobody gets adopted into the family of God. We're all born again into the family of God. We're born through the Spirit, which is the water and the blood. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. It's a supernatural thing. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a supernatural rebirth of your spirit. And that's done through the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood and the water. It says that in the Bible. So that is not, you're not somehow like, it's not some piece of paper he signs. It's through blood and water that you're born into the family of God. This adoption of sons means that you are given that status of a full-grown son. That you're given the status, the full, like, you get to make decisions like an adult in the family of God. So don't ever let anyone lay a trip on you that you're too young of a Christian to do this or you're too young of a Christian to do that. Some of the youngest Christians in the world have been some of the most dynamic movers in God's kingdom. Don't think you have to build up years or all these experiences before God will use you. You're fully equipped. You're adopted as sons. It says... Um, Adoption of sons through Christ Jesus according to the purpose of his will, to the praise and the glory of grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That's one of my most favorite, favorite phrases to text my, one of my kids or my wife. You are blessed in the beloved. Blessed in the beloved. Is it, in other words, God's got you covered. God's got you covered. Like this morning... You might not be able to tell, but I ate a bratwurst. But you can't see it. Well, maybe you can see the effects of it. But it's in me. You don't see the bratwurst, you see me. So when God looks at you, you're in Christ. You're blessed in the beloved. You're covered by him. When God looks at you, he sees his son. He sees his son's righteousness. He sees his son's perfection. He's not looking at you. So sometimes I look in the mirror and say, I'm not holy, I'm not righteous, I'm not blameless. 
and God's going, you're not seeing, you're not seeing yourself in him, in the beloved. You are blessed in the beloved. That's a wonderful status to have in the Lord. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Do you know what redemption is? Like that's, a, that's a one of those big Christian words. But I can make it real simple for all of you. Well, here's an old analogy. Do you, do you know what greenback stamps are? If you're old, you know. <laughs> I'm old, I know. Because I used to lick them for my grandma and put them in these books. You go to the grocery store, they give you so many stamps. You lick them, you stick them in books. And then where did you take them? To the redemption center. And my grandma used to redeem them for presents for us for Christmas. So I had a vested interest in putting those stamps in those books, right? <laughs> but if you're, if you're younger than that, you're like, I don't know what he's talking about. I got one of these in the mail the other day. Does anyone know what that is? Those are Culver's coupons. And they're for ice cream and burgers. And these are redeemable at Culver's. You know what they're worth right now? Nothing. I need to take this thing back to its source and it will become something of value. So these things are screaming to me. Take me back to my source. Make me worth something. That I'm worth something when I go back to the source. That's what it is. Redemption. That's what God is doing with you. He made you. He owns you. You're his possession. And when he redeems you, he takes you from your fallen state and out of the world, brings you back to the source where now you are of value. So you'll never look at a Culver's coupon the same again. This is, this is redemption. This is what we are in Christ. He has redeemed us. He has brought us back to the source and made us of value. The circle is complete in him. It says, the redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. So, do you have trespasses? I think we all know what trespassing is being in Wisconsin. Because <laughs> there's signs up everywhere. Don't step over there. You don't belong over there. Have you ever been a place where you didn't belong? You ever put your hands where they didn't belong, your feet where they didn't belong, your eyes where they didn't belong, your heart where it didn't belong? He redeems us from those trespasses. He brings us back from those trespasses. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It says, um, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished uh, on us, all wisdom and insight. So he's given you wisdom and he's given you insight. What's wisdom? That's of all the knowledge out there, it's knowing where to place those pieces of knowledge in the right way. It's rightly using knowledge. Because some people are very knowledgeable. They're book smart. But they can't apply it. Wisdom is knowledge applied rightly. And God gives you the supernatural ability to apply your knowledge in the right way. And then insight is being able to see clearly. I became a lot better mechanic. Like, I could never figure out how things came apart. And I always struggle as a mechanic. And I got, I got a hold of a couple guys who were good mechanics. And you know one thing that mechanics always have? Good lights. They light up what they're, so they can see it. You ever notice in the operating room what they do? Bright lights. As you get older and you want to see things, bright lights. When I was younger, I, didn't, I could read in the dark practically. But if I want to be able to see something, I've got to light it up. So God gives us supernatural wisdom, the way to apply knowledge, and he gives us insight. He turns the light out on things. All these things are things that we are in Christ. We're up to, you know, about ten right now. Ten different things that we are in Christ. The next thing it says, it says that um, wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will. 
the mystery of his will. Every time you see the word mystery in the Bible, it doesn't mean like magic. It doesn't mean like a mystery novel. What it means is something that was formerly hidden from the people in the Bible. And now it's been brought to light. And what was formerly hidden in the Bible that now has been brought to light is that God would like all people to come to him through Christ Jesus. He made that apparent to us. He shared that mystery with us. He made us partners in that. It says, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God wants to, through Jesus Christ, unite everything back to himself. He created the universe. He created the world. He created all people, and he wants all people in the universe brought back to him through Christ Jesus. So that is his plan. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. So we have an inheritance, and it says we have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So in him, we have an inheritance. Inheritance is a really important one to me. Because what it means is, is that we are a co-heir or co-inheritor with Christ. How, how secure is your inheritance if it's Christ's inheritance? If you're a co-inheritor with Christ. And this is, again, a bold claim where I'm like, what do you mean we're going to co-inherit with Jesus Christ? It also says we're going to co-reign with Jesus Christ. What does it mean to co-reign and co-inherit with Jesus Christ? Have you thought of yourself that way? No, we're, we always think of ourselves as way down here. And, and I'm not for this like, self-esteem thing where you just build people up for no good reason. Like, you're special and you're good and that picture you drew looks wonderful when all they did is scribble on a piece of paper. I'm not down with that. But I am down with this, that if God says something about you and it doesn't seem to be apparently true, then your perception is off. Because what God says is true, and your perception can be off sometimes. So when he says that he endows you with all wisdom and all knowledge, that you're a co-inheritor with Christ, that you're going to co-reign with Christ, it's true. Now absorb that. Think about who you are in him. Think about who you are in him. And this is where we get to the spot Or like I said before we started, I don't think there's any way to properly explain this that people are going to be like this. Oh, yeah, that's me. Because I'm saying it, and it's in the Bible. You can read it for yourself. But what do you really feel about yourself right now? What do you feel about what I'm saying right now? Hmm, that's an interesting take on that. I don't know if that's who I really am or not. This is something God has to supernaturally impress upon your heart. You can accept it as God's word, uh, because I'm not going to tell you this stuff unless it's true. I'm not going to say it unless it's in the word of God. So like I said, I encourage you to read this chapter for yourself. Read through it, look through it, and go, wow, that's who God says I am. That I was predestined according to the purposes of works, all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's verse 13. That's another promise. You were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Do you see how God... God picks us, right? It says he picks us before the foundations of the earth. He chooses us. Then we see how the Son comes and redeems us and saves us. And now we're seeing that the Holy Spirit is like the seal on that. It's saying, you're mine. I'm putting my mark on you. I'm sealing you. Sealed by the Holy Spirit is the same concept as, uh, for those of you who are married, you have a ring on your finger. That means, that means you belong to somebody, right? 
thing. That's mine. I put a ring on that. That's mine. And it's like, well, you better, you better mine that ring because it symbolizes something else. Same, with the, same thing with the Holy Spirit. He puts his ring on you. You're mine. You're my special possession. And whenever, I want to I clear this up. The Bible will say that God is jealous for us. He is jealous for me. Jealousy in the human sense is not good. Because jealousy is like this. I want you for myself, for my benefit. Me, mine. God's kind of jealousy goes like this. I have a special purpose for you. I have something planned for you. You're my special possession and I want what's best for you. And I don't want to see you hurt yourself by bringing anything else into that. That's going to wreck you. That's going to hurt you. I'm jealous for you and your future. Same way you'd be with your kids. You're jealous for your kids' safety. You're jealous for your kids' opportunities in the future. Like, your kid can go out and do what they want to at 18 years old, right? They wreck their life. What's your responsibility as a parent? To hand them their life at 18 and go, it's yours now. I tried to train you and I tried to guide you and I tried to, you know, nurture you and protect you from yourself and your decisions and but now it's yours. You're jealous for their future, you're jealous for their life, you're jealous for their well-being. That's how God is jealous for us. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. The Father picked us, the Son redeems us, and the Holy Spirit guarantees us. He puts his ring on us and says, you're mine from the beginning to the end. It says um, in verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? So until we get there and can actually put our hands on our possession, on our inheritance that God has given us, the Holy Spirit's going, I got you. I got you. In verse 15, it says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And so he's always going to remember them in their prayers because they're doing well. Have you ever noticed what we mostly pray for? Things that are not doing well. If things are not going well, we pray for them. The Apostle Paul here has a different formula. He says, you're doing really well. I'm going to pray for you. Do you know what Satan... <laughs> Do you know what Satan, what he uses his resources on? Things that are going well. Take the guy who's living his life for himself. Doing what he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to. You think Satan puts a lot of pressure and power on that guy? Well, he's like, huh, he's taking care of himself. Divert the resources to the people who aren't doing that. Divert the resources to the people who are doing well. Some of you in your Christian walk, God tells you to do stuff. He says, get up, go, do. You're like, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go, I'm going to do. And Satan goes, we need to keep that guy on the ground. That guy don't need to get up. He don't need to get going. We need to get him down, keep him down. If you're doing well, Satan's like, I have a purpose and a plan for your life. Let's not knock that guy off the mark. If we can't do it through opposition, let's do it through prosperity. But let's do something to him to mess him up. Satan uses his powers, his, um, his time to try to mess with people who are doing well. So pray for those who are doing well like the Apostle Paul does here. He says, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation of knowledge of him. This is in verse 17. It says, he is praying that God will give them the spirit of wisdom and the revelation of knowledge. Now, why does he want them to have wisdom and knowledge? There's a point he's trying to get across here to them. There's a thing, like, he wants them to grasp a concept. 
and he knows they cannot grasp this concept unless they are supernaturally given wisdom and knowledge. It says, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. So he wants supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge, supernatural sight, so these people can see something. He wants them to see the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? He wants us to understand completely. He wants to light us up. He wants to light up our senses so we can understand who we are with all the saints. And when I say saints, you know, you're like, well, I'm no saint. Well, you're the saint or you're an ain't. You're either saved or you're not saved. If you're saved, you're a saint. If you're not saved, you're not a saint. That's just simple. Saint ain't. That's the way I remember it. It's like um, someone asked me the other day, what's a Jew? I'm like, well, And I explained to God's people, what's a Gentile? I said, everyone who's not that. You know, every, if you're not a Jew, then you're a Gentile. If you're not a saint, then you're something else. If you're a believer, you're a saint. I mean, we've turned it into kind of a Saint Mary and Saint this and Saint... But that's not the way the Bible shows it. So it says he wants, he wants us to understand when it says this hope. Hope means the confident expectation. He wants us to have a confident expectation of the glorious inheritance that's in all the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us? He wants us to be lit up, our knowledge, our wisdom, our insight, so that we can understand his power towards us. And the power that he has towards us is the exact same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Like, that's some tremendous, crazy power. That's the power he has towards us. And again, if I just said this on my own, you'd be like, well, he must be making this up or making it try to sound grandiose or whatever. But the next verse says, of us who believe according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. So he's saying the same power that raised Jesus up from the dead put him on the right hand of God and made him who he is in every age and in every age to come is the same power that's being reached out to us. Now that is mind-blowing. And he says it's so mind-blowing, I want you to supernaturally have wisdom and knowledge and that you would supernaturally have insight and be able to see this. Because before you do a thing for the church, a thing in the service of God, you need to know who you are in God. There's way too many people going out and doing stuff for God, and they don't even know who they are. Have you seen that in church before? People busy about doing the things of God? And they're so ticked off about it. They're so uptight. I mean, if they hadn't cleaned up their act, they'd be going... Blankety blank, we got to get this blanking thing going because, you know, the Lord's coming back. And it, like, whoa. Jesus said this to his disciples sometimes. You don't know what spirit you're of. You're out trying to win the world to me, and you're like, oh, they won't come to you. Psst, nuke them. <laughs> People say, I love ministry. I love, I love the idea of church, and I love ministry. You know what? I don't like people. I hate people. It's like, hmm, that's, that's when you're trying to do it in your own power and you're not seeing who you are and who he is. You've got to know who you are. You've got to know how he sees you. And you've got to understand the power and the resources that he's put towards you before you take one step forward for him. That's the thing about taking four hours to sharpen the axe before you take one swipe at the tree. Because otherwise we make a bloody mess of things. A lot of friction. A lot of friction. He says grace and peace to you when he starts this epistle. That should be the earmark of us Christians. Graceful. What's graceful mean? A very large person. And I don't mean large like me. I mean like a very big person. Like 
Oh, that's very big of you. Oh, wow, you overlooked that fault? That's very big of you. Oh, you went the extra mile? Well, that was really big of you. That person's really just a, you know, they're just a very gracious person. They're just always forgiving people. They're always loving people. They're always, I mean, I can't help it. It's like a haunting thought, a good haunting thought with Charlie Bland's funeral. As, um, <laughs> as, as Jason was speaking about Charlie and saying he was too nice of a guy, that's what he had heard, and then he started saying what love was. He said, what's love? Patience, kindness, self-control, gentleness. It's like Charlie, 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 Charlie. His grace personified. Did he have peace? Oh, you bet he did. You see, Charlie, you know, anytime he spoke of the gospel, his voice would quiver. He always had that far off look like, I know where I'm going. Um, recently, uh, someone close to our family, Linda Swenson, died, and that's who Aunt Linda was. She was such a saint that I remember my wife saying, when she wasn't saved, she thought, well, I can't be like her. I'm not like Aunt Linda. You know, she thought that was just a character quality of who she was because she showed love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control, kindness. It like was a check, Linda, 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 Linda. It's like that's what we're to be as Christians. We're to be before we perform. Because when you do something for somebody and it's out of that being in Christ and being all these things, because if you look at all these qualities, they're just mind-blowing who we are in Christ. But if you try to just do without the be, then you might get called a hypocrite. The church might get a bad name over time, like it has. Because you see people getting goal-oriented like we are, getting performance-driven like we are, trying to operate under their own power, and then you're forced to be something that you're not. Put on your smile for church. Do your service at church. You wouldn't want anyone thinking that you were having a bad week. How are you doing, brother? Doing swell. How are you? You go back out and you struggle. You need to know that God's supernatural power that he raised Christ from the dead with, that that's working in you. That the inheritance that, it, that Christ is going to inherit, that's your inheritance. You're a co-inheritor, and that power is working in us. It says, to close up here, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. That's an amazing verse. Because he hasn't said anything about church yet. But all of a sudden he says, and he put all things under Jesus' feet. And he gave him his head over all things to the church. Do you realize he's heading up this whole thing? All things are under his feet, and all things are his, and he's our head. That's where you can say, if God be for us, who can be against us? If he's empowering my steps, what can stand in my way? But you have to remember who you are, where he came from. This is, which is the body, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills us all. His body. That's who the church is. We are his arms and legs and fingers and toes. We are the working out of Christ on earth. He said, it would be better if I leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. And his disciples were all like this. What do you mean it'd be better if you left? He's saying that more could get accomplished through the Holy Spirit working through people than one Christ on earth. We are his body. We are the Christ that people see. We are the Jesus that people see. We are the walking, talking picture of Jesus. But you can't be that if you don't have peace and you don't have grace. So I would encourage you all
as we get ready to take communion here, I would encourage you all that through the week, this has been a lot. When I read through this, I'm like, I'm going to cover this. I, mean, I could cover this in weeks. I could do like a, a sermon series on this one chapter. But it's like, I'm just going to throw it all out there. Pray the same thing Paul prayed. Holy Spirit, <laughs> push this into people. Let them understand who they are. But if this has your mind swimming a little bit, or you're like, wow, that's intriguing, read it for yourself. Look through here what God has for you and who he says you are. It, it will really wash your mind of this perception of who you are. So let's just transition smoothly in here to communion. Because the communion is the celebration of the oneness of the body of Christ. The oneness of the body of Christ. We're going to do a procedure here where we take a little cracker, a little piece of bread, and a little thing of juice. And we're going to think about what Jesus did on the cross for us. But here's what I want you to remember. Is that when Jesus did this, he was laying around a table on the floor with his 12 disciples. They're all laying there. They're breaking off bread and they're all dipping together. They're having this big meal together. They're double dipping. It's community. It's guys together eating. So when I think of communion, I don't think of it traditionally like this. I think of communion when we're having potluck. Where we come together in Jesus' name and we share all things together. Thank you, Jeff. I think of um, that as being true communion. So when we get together like this, it's important that we remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. And that as a church, as a group of believers, the only prerequisite for someone taking communion is that they believe, that they believe in Christ as their Savior, then we're all part of the body of Christ. And this is a uniting thing where we all eat together, acknowledge God. When we all drink together and acknowledge, we're all one, unified in Christ. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth. And in verse 23 of chapter 11, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The eating of the bread and the drinking of the wine is to say to people, we're not going to forget Jesus till he comes back. We're not going to forget what we're really supposed to be doing here. What we're supposed to be doing is spreading the gospel to the people around us and building up other Christians in the faith. So building up other Christians and spreading the gospel out, that's the natural order. And the church is what God wants us to do it through. There's no other vehicle by which God has given us other than the church. But I don't think, I think it's very important that before you take, like I said, one step forward doing, you need to spend your time figuring out who you are, being. Are you in Christ? 
Do you acknowledge what he's doing in your life? Let's close in prayer.